Hello, thank you for joining. This is the Radio Surgery Society webinar series for 2023. My name is James. I am your webinar coordinator, and we are going to kick it off. We have a very exciting webinar today. Uh, the title is Vault Free, Cobalt Free Radio Surgery Technology Introduction and Case Review from Neurosurgery One. We have a little bit of housekeeping. This webinar has been supported by unrestricted grant from ZAP. Our webinars for the Webinar Society, our live webinars are free to anyone interested in learning about SRS SBRT. Access to recorded webinars is limited to RSS members only. CME awards are available for those who attend our entire live webinar broadcast. Now, without further ado, I wanna introduce our moderator, Dr. Panulo. Um, we're very honored to have her today with us. She's the Director of Neurosurgical Radiosurgery and Neuro Neuro-Oncology at the Well Cornell Brain and Spine Center. We're very honored to have her with us. Without further ado, take it away, Dr. Panulo. Hey, good morning. Thank you so much, uh, James, and thank you, Justin and David, for joining us today. I'm gonna do some quick introductions and then I'll let the show get rolling. Um, first is Justin Keener. He earned his master's degree in medical physics from Duke in 2007 and completed an ABR certification in therapeutic medical physics in 2011. He's worked in radiation oncology centers in Virginia, Florida, and North Carolina, part of joining the Center for Health team where he spent the last six years as a site physicist for Littleton Adventist Hospital in his home state of Colorado. Littleton Adventist and Nursery One are early adopters of ZAPX, which we'll be talking about today using it clinically since uh, this past summer, 2022. Our second speaker will be Dr. David Van Sickle, uh, who is a specialist in um, neurological surgery and a national expert in robotic guided uh, deep brain stimulation uh, with the patient asleep. Uh, he has uh, used this procedure for uh, symptoms of Parkinson's disease, tremor, essential tremor, um, dystonia, epilepsy, and obsessive compulsive disorder. He ranks among the top surgeons globally in terms of the number of these procedures he's performed, and he publishes research on the technique and trains surgeons worldwide in the technique. He's got a PhD in biomedical engineering, which he's used to patent medical technologies and also to help uh, leading edge technology uh, to make sure that it can be made available to patients outside of traditional academic medical centers. He's a member of the American Association of Neurological Surgeons, the Congress of Neurological Surgeons, and the American Medical Association. And my understanding is he is also an early adopter of ZAP technology, which they'll be talking about today. So I will let us get started with uh, Justin. Go for it. Actually, I think we're going to do the order and start with myself and first. You got it. Go for it. All right. Let's see if we can share a screen here. James, can we let? Oh, there we go. Excellent. You got it. Okay. All right, yeah. David. Thank you. No problem at all. So today we're going to talk about the ZAPX. Um, it's actually fairly new, um, though an iteration of something kind of old. So if anybody knows uh, or has used a gamma knife in the past, you're going to find actually much of this quite familiar. Uh, I'm going to restrict my talk to, and what I talk about to very high level information and kind of clinical based information. And I'll let, um, I'll let Justin actually get rid of this bar here so we don't have to see that um, and I'll let uh, Justin talk about the nitty-gritty details uh, from that point onwards so right into the clinical use of this I, I decided to, to take the tack you advance the slide here of well first of all what's the machine so this is what the machine looks like uh, so it's a giant ball um, and inside that ball is two gimbal axes, and then inside that's a linear accelerator, which allows a small linac to race around shooting a beam uh, with different size collimators from different directions, thereby emulating what a gamma knife does with multiple sources uh, doing it simultaneously. And some things we'll talk about are that it is completely internally shielded, uh, it doesn't need cobalt sources, and it doesn't have a vault, but in, otherwise it, it acts much like what a gamma knife would act. So I decided to, to start what I wanted to talk about by looking at 
what the alternatives were and what the real competition to to radio surgery actually is. And so I'm a neurosurgeon. I am a stereotactic neurosurgeon in the sense that I do large numbers of deep brain stimulation. And so accuracy is something that I'm um, very interested in. Uh, and that, that will come about as we as we talk our way through this. But this is a this is a real case. This is a case that um, came to me about three weeks ago. It's one that we haven't treated. So Justin's looking at it right now going, hey, I don't know what this case is. Um, and this is about a 2.1 centimeter bifrontal meningioma. How this came to me is from one of my partners who was a little bit overloaded and said, hey, I can't get to this. Could you do it this weekend? And I said, yeah, sure. And this is about three weekends ago. Um, so I looked at it and I'm, I'm like, well, you know, we could do this or we could maybe treat this with radio surgery, but 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 all right. Um, and everybody said, well, the person's really, really symptomatic. And I said, all right, if they're symptomatic, maybe maybe I should take this out. So let's look at what this person's symptoms were. Uh, they had severe, severe loss of balance. They had severe photophobia. In fact, when I went into the patient's room, what I noticed was that uh, the lights were turned out and in fact, uh, wouldn't actually let me turn the lights on. But also I noticed when I was talking to him and talking to his wife specifically, he had no personality changes. I would have expected to see that because if this was gonna cause any problems, and if you notice there's no edema around it, and you'll have to trust me on a T2 MRI, there isn't any edema around this at all. Um, I would expect the first thing to change would be personality changes from the gyrus recti. So I was like, hmm, is there something wrong here? So I looked, at, I looked at him more, I talked to him more, I talked to the hospitalist, I spent a couple hours with him clinically. And I learned some more about him. Let's change the next slide here. Um, and I was thinking, what, what are the get this next slide here? Here we go. What are the what are the risks if I take this out? And this is what this is what I would write on the paper. So if I was taking somebody to surgery, this is what I would write down. Um, and it's not just limited to this. So what could happen? I could give him a stroke. In fact, almost the stroke that I would give him might be a, a Huber stroke, which would give him potentially some personality changes, some memory problem. Um, paralysis and death are actually possible from the surgery. Um, he could have blindness. Uh, he could have loss of sense of smell. Um, you can avulse the um, olfactory nerves quite easily from this. Almost certainly will avulse one side if you come from a terional approach from one side. Or if you do a bifrontal approach, almost certainly will avulse both of them and giving him complete loss of smell lifelong. Um, he could have an infection. Um, he could have to have need for additional surgery. So if I do a bifrontal approach, there's a very high likelihood of CSF leak. We'd have to um, basically cranialize the frontal sinus that is completely drilled out, remove the frontal sinus, flap a piece of pericranium over that frontal sinus to seal it, and potentially do that with an, an ear, nose, and throat surgeon as a combined surgery. If I did a terional approach, it could go around the frontal sinus and it would lessen that possibility, but actually increase the risk for stroke because it would have to reach across from one side to the other side. Uh, potentially damaging some arterial constructions. Um, he could have personality changes because uh, I could damage the gyrus rexus. In fact, almost certainly would on one side. If it came from the right side, I might leave the left side intact. Um, he could potentially have cranial nerve dysfunction. Double vision would not be um, out of the question. Uh, certainly could stroke the optic nerve. Almost certainly would have incomplete resection. We wouldn't get it all out. And in the end of it, would need to have radiation because we wouldn't get it all out. So all along the floor of that, where the uh, it, it spreads along the dura, these are creatures of the dura, um, we 100% chance we wouldn't get all this out. So we would end up having to do radiation anyway. So you know, I'm sort of going, taking this out doesn't seem real attractive, you know, from a value perception for, or from a value proposition for this patient. Then when I talked to him a little bit further, I said, okay, so what are what medical problems are we talking about here? What, what are our, you know, how do we modify those risks you know, for this individual person? So he's diabetic um, and his A1C is actually greater than 14.8. So here at Littleton Hospital, the highest we can measure is 14.8. Um, and so it's higher than that, <laughs> so which is terrible. Uh, his, he's got severe peripheral neuropathy. That's why his balance is so bad. Um, is that his peripheral neuropathy so bad he can't feel his feet. So it's not really maybe from the meningioma, it's, it's actually from um, his uncontrolled diabetes. Uh, he's got photophobia, that could be from a meningioma. There are case reports where frontal meningiomas can cause this, but they're usually um, 
actually convexity ones that cause that. So, so maybe, but but most likely, usually there's a lot of edema around it if that's going to be the case. There is any edema around this, but actually uncontrolled diabetes clearly does cause photopolia. So it's almost really it. Oh, and by the way, he's mild cardiac failure. But I got this this lesion, which is two centimeters greatest dimension. So let's assume I can park this guy in a in a rehab someplace and over the next three months, get him some medical care and maybe some insulin. And he can get a um, his diabetes under control and make him a better risk factor. And now actually get him where he could potentially live 10 more years. Um, and if that's the case, well, I could operate and take this out at that time. Or maybe I just I should just do this. And this is, you know, what Lars Lexell invented. Just do stereotactic radio surgery, one shot. Um, you're going to end up probably doing it anyway at the end after an incomplete resection. You just do it right up front. Um, and that's, you know, in the end, why this was invented or what its popular use was for. I, I realized that why it was invented was mostly for functional surgery. But um, but in the end, its biggest primary use was benign tumors and vascular lesions. Um, and this is what all of our thinking would go to in the neurosurgery world. And, and so one begs the question is, why aren't we, why was I asked to take this out in the first place? Um, and, and it has to do with most neurosurgeons don't have access to this. So, and they, and here's the dirty secret, they don't have financial access to it. So, and the reason why is these are expensive. So the neurosurgeon gets rewarded for doing this surgery with this really high risk. Well, they don't get rewarded for doing, you know, sending them to their, to uh, somebody to do a LINAC case. Um, and, and so they don't refer them. So the real competition here is actually resection. And the thing that's broken into this is the gamma knife. But the problem with it is, this is an early one, obviously. The problem with this, though, is it's super expensive. And there's two things that drive that expense. And we're going to talk about that. And this is what drove us to, to purchase a ZAP. Let's talk about what the zap is. So the zap, as I alluded to it earlier, I had the picture of it, is it is a linear accelerator. So it is a Linac in a sense. Um, it's got a couch just like a um, just like a, uh, a gamma knife has. It does move a little bit differently. The couch actually, instead of sliding side to side, actually rotates side to side. That doesn't make a ton of difference, but and Justin can talk about that in more detail. Um, but nevertheless, it moves the center of the head around the center of um, uh, an isocenter where the beam uh, is projected. Now it doesn't project uh, 196 beams like a perfection unit would, but it does pro project one beam um, and it can move it to 196 places if you like, or any number of places. And that's something we should talk about in detail is the number of places that this can move to, because this can be operated in a way that's a bit more like a gamma knife or can operate in a way that's a bit more like a traditional linear accelerator. And how you operate it, it depends on what your goals are. Um, and we're just learning that now as we're getting our very earliest experience being an early adopter of this. But what happens is on these two different gimbals, um, the uh, the linear accelerator here, which is shown in that, uh, I don't know if you can see my screen, my pointer on here, uh, I don't think so, um, which shows projecting the beam, um, it runs around to multiple different positions. We'll go on to the next slide here. This shows the shielded treatment space, the, um, the shield doors on it, and it shows the patient couch, imaging detector, collimator. It also real-time measures the dose. I'll leave that up to Justin to talk about. It's relatively patient-friendly, um, and, and it's big. So you think, oh, you're going to, have to be inside this enclosed space. It's actually considerably bigger than an MRI. Keep in mind, the standard MRI up until recently was only 60 centimeters. This shows what a large bore MRI would look like in comparison, which is 70 centimeters. Um, and this is 83. It's actually quite roomy inside. I don't think we're going to have any problems with claustrophobia. Uh, we never really did with a gamma knife. I don't expect we're going to here. Um, but the benefit is it's internally shielded. And we're going to move through that quickly. Um, it does have uh, repeated KV imaging. So instead of using a frame like Alexa would use, uh, it has a X-ray um, and that allows it to, uh, um, originally people would say continuously, I would say repeatedly. So basically at, at each shot, it can take a new shot and make sure it's aligned. Um, Justin will talk about that in a bit more detail, but it can basically keep checking its alignment um, with the patient in a face mask. And that does make it a lot easier to treat in a fractionated manner if you want to do three fractions or five fractions, it definitely increases the patient comfort. In fact, I just treated somebody last week 
who was previously treated on a gamma knife and now had a repeat treatment on a zap a number of years later with a marginal recurrence of a meningioma. Um, and, you know, I said, how did the gamma knife treat you before? And he goes, oh, it was fine. I just didn't like the pins. That hurt for like three or four weeks. And I said, we don't have them here. And he, he seemed to like that pretty, pretty good. Uh, when you talk about the immobilization, though, um, I think it's really important to talk about how accurate a Lexile frame really is. Um, and, and this is something I'll talk about. And, and I don't have a good slide for it, but, but it, it probably one of the most important things I do talk about. And that is Lexile frames really aren't that accurate. Um, there's an internal study done by Medtronic. It was made public because it was part of an FDA submission for a uh, software that they use for their S8 um, a system used for navigation in the operating room. Um, and that's that's used for, it's called Stealth, and the eighth version is the S8. The FDA made them, um, with their software, go back and take a look at how accurate it was used for deep brain stimulation. And for and for biopsies, and so what they had to do was, you know, for, at first Medtronic kicked it back and said, "Listen, you know, we don't make the head frame, the Lexile head frame. It's the same frame, by the way, for radio surgery as it is for surgery. It's exactly the same device." They said, "We don't make it. That's Lexile's problem." But the FDA goes, "Nope, nope. You have to guarantee to end it in." So Medtronic was stuck doing an end it in study, and they used a bunch of frames. They used a CRW frame, which is a surgical frame, kind of like a Lexile frame. They used a Lexile frame. They used a Next frame, which is a small plastic frame that mounts to the skull, um, and they used Starfix device, which is a 3D printed uh, device made by a company called Fred Hare. And and they compared them all, and they didn't compare them all for purpose of saying, "Hey, which one's best?" But they just did it to say, "Hey, end to end, we have sufficient accuracy to get through the FDA." Um, and, and so th they were kind of stuck in this awkward position of ended up comparing frames. It's not something Medtronic really wanted to do, but they did it. And they published it and, and they, they, for the most part, buried it because they didn't really want to, um, their, their goal wasn't to go into competition with the frame manufacturers. But, but ultimately, the, the result is, is that a Lexical frame is only accurate to about 1.7 millimeters on average. That means that half of the time it's worse than that. So, so that's that's the accuracy we really have. So that's something that's really important to know is, is that when you're putting somebody in a mask and that we're using a KV imager, um, you know, so a simple x-ray imager in order to line things up, are we really losing anything? And the answer probably is, is no, no. In fact, we might be better than we were because you put somebody in Lexo frame, you assume they're in the right spot, but you don't really have any idea. You hope, you hope they're okay. Um, and the other issue I think is really important to talk about is how accurate are source MRIs. And being a DBS surgeon, this is something I take a lot of effort in. Uh, for example, all of my DBS cases have the MRI acquired with a patient under full anesthesia. And the reason I do that is because, you know, we spend literally millions of dollars in the operating room using robotics in order to um, make sure we have uh, super accurate alignment. And yet we, we put somebody for the source image in the MRI completely awake, moving around a little bit which is equally as important. Um, and what we'll do is we'll say, well, I acquired my images using a 3D acquisition. Well, that just means you couldn't see the movement. So it's all blurred together. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. So, so you still have any accuracy associated with that. So when you really look at it from end-to-end -end point of view is, is likely this is as accurate, if not, if that's not more accurate than, than a gamma knife is. Um, I think the, I think the data is still out on that. I think it's supposed to something to be proven, um, but, um, I do think that when you compare it, you have to compare it um, with like to like. And that actually comes down to a couple other things we'll make, points we'll make here in a moment. Um, the other thing is, is that, so it's dedicated for radio surgery, it's meant for radio surgery, no compromises were made um, for treating things outside the brain. In fact, you can't really treat anything outside the brain, though it can treat down to about C7. Um, so something gamma, if you go down about C2 realistically, and some people, this can go down about C7. So it does, it does able to reach down the cervical spine a little bit more. We haven't tried that yet, so I don't, I don't want to, I don't want anybody to go buy it with the idea that that's guaranteed going to happen. But, but we believe that it will happen. But it's primarily for metastatic and benign brain tumors, as well as vascular lesions, um, and potentially for functional. Though I have not used for that yet. So if somebody asked me about that, I, I don't have any experience with that at this time. Um, it has a um, independent gantry that's the, basically the, um, the beam can move around to up to 260 plus unique positions, so well more than a gamma knife can. It has a, a slightly larger workspace, though in practice not there yet, but, but is getting there with uh, up to the couch. 
Um, and it's designed for non-coplanar delivery, which basically means it's it's an isocentric device. This is meant for isocentric um, care, and that's an important piece when in how you use it. Um, it was designed for the ground up, not to have um, not to have the trade-offs that you would have with say a multi-leaf collimator, where you have more bleed dose um, and you um, around around the outside, and you end up getting less dose to the whole brain in general, um, and the beam itself, because it's it's a it's collimated beam, more like a cone uh, would be, is that you're going to end up with uh, a lot lower leakage than you would have, say, again with a multi-leaf collimator. Um, and that also is in part because the beam is a lot shorter. I wanna, this is really what I want to talk about here, uh, and this has to do with how you use the machine. So so what we really need is we need a gamma knife because we need a gamma knife in more places where more surgeons have access to it. Um, so that they're not taking risks with patients that don't need to be taken uh, surgically, but but treat things, become more comfortable with what the gamma knife can do. But we need it at a lower cost than the gamma knife can deliver. And this device, I think, is the one to do that, but I think it's, it's dependent upon how we use it. So you can use it in a more LINAC-like fashion, or you can use it in a more gamma-like fashion. And because you have a beam that can run around to you know, 200 different positions, 260 positions, different positions, because you can inherently treat in an isocentric manner, it doesn't mean that you will. Um, so if you look at this, the trade-offs can be is that you can treat with you know, more LINAC-like, you can treat with fewer beams, you can um, treat with more inhomogeneous beam intensity. So some beams are weighted a lot more, some beams are weighted a lot less. Um, you can treat with a smaller utilization of the actual overall workspace that you could potentially have. And this makes you fairly sensitive to rotation errors. So that's, that's, the, that's sort of the knock on, on using, um, you know, say, a true beam, is that you're, you're quite sensitive to rotation errors. Or you can use it in a way that's actually more gamma knife-like, which is the direction that this, this device needs to be utilized. Um, and that is, you know, use many beams. Um, and that does have a trade-off. It means the treatment time might be a little bit longer, but, but that's something that I think you have to, you have to do. Is more homogeneous beam intensity, so the beams are fairly similar. Um, so if you use a lot of beams and the bones here are fairly similar, we as neurosurgeons would argue, hey, you can shoot one right down the retina, right down the optic nerve, right through the optic chiasm, and it doesn't make a damn bit of difference because if there's 200 of them um, and each beam is equal intensity, then that beam doesn't have much intensity to it, and so it doesn't matter. Um, so you know, being a little rotationally misaligned, like you're gonna be because your MRI isn't that accurate and because people move a little bit, or you are in say gamma, it doesn't matter. So that's that's the key is, is to treat in the more gamma knife like fashion and really maximize your utilization of your workspace. So spread those beams out. That makes you very robust to rotation errors. And so, so I do think this the, the device has a lot of the inherent benefits of a gamma knife, but only if used in a gamma knife like way. Um, hopefully that was that was evident the way I said that. Um, the, the, now you might say we, I've said alluded to many times here that uh, that is cheaper. So why is it cheaper? And, and there's two main reasons. One, and this is a, a stock picture taken from them, but this actually looks just like our installation. But we have two glass walls, not one glass wall, um, and a glass door that goes out the side. And so we, I guess the glass door does lock, but there's no security in it because we don't need a vault. So because it's entirely self-shielded, you can stand right next to it while it operates. In fact, I did, and have. Um, and you can just sit at a table, have a cup of coffee, and I suppose don't spill it on the computer. Um, but you can actually sit there and watch the thing run, and you don't need to install a lead line room or vault to run it. And that saves you, here they put a million dollars, it's probably more realistically two. So it saves you $2 million installation, which allows these to be installed with smaller neurosurgery programs um, that have um, fewer number of neurosurgeons, and then therefore allow us to maybe not be cutting people open that don't need to be cut open. Um, and it's a lot more flexible in where you cite it. You can put it, you know, next to a conference room, you know, next to a patient room, you can, you can put it next to anything. So as long as it's on a ground floor that, that can um, hold the weight. So that's, that's, the, that's the main restriction is, is being able to hold the weight. Um, and then we go on to no cobalt. So every, you know, you don't have to spend a million bucks plus um, to reload the thing and, and, or be left with a situation well, hey, we've been in this thing for five years. Uh, times are getting kind of long. Should we do it? I don't know. I don't know if it's been another million dollars. Maybe we should do it next year. Next year's capital budget. So this will never have to be reloaded, ever. So that cost completely is eliminated. Um, and that, that eliminates a 
giant, giant um, headache. So you have a wall which is built that has to be torn down and a robot which then delivers the cobalt sources and reloads it. Plus you don't have to have the bureaucratic headaches associated with it and you don't have to have continuous on-site video security which you have um, in a gamma. All that stuff just completely vanishes. So um, like I said, the door to the outside, um, which is we use as an emergency door, we don't use it as a normal door, it's a glass door like you'd see on the front of a strip mall. Um, and that's all we need. So we just don't need you know, massive security. We don't have a, um, we don't have cobalt sources that could be used to make a dirty bomb. So that cuts down the expense. It's probably more than that moving forward, given the way our prices are going. So, so basically, in summary, is you have a neurosurgery friendly device um, that works like a gamma knife if used in a gamma knife like way, uh, but with no vault, no cobalt. And in our estimation, in our installation here at Littleton, is that's a two million dollar savings. Um, and that, that that we wouldn't have it if if that wasn't the case. So if we if these two things weren't true, we wouldn't have this device. And if we wouldn't have this device, we'd be trucking our cases across town like we were um, to our competitors. Um, or we would have doctors who we have several surgeons in our group that are just not that familiar with um, isocentric uh, stereotactic radiation, doing surgeries on people that maybe maybe are aren't all that necessary. We could have just treated uh, with radio surgery instead. Uh, and so you get be better patient care and potentially make a profit center out of it in the, in the process. Um, I'll just leave it at that. And I'll let, uh, I'll let Justin take it from there if you're, if you're up for it. Thanks so much, Dave. That was really actually great. Justin, you good? I believe so. Do you see my screen? Yep, you're good. All right. Well, there yes, you go. That's, and, that's us. And that's uh, probably today, is it? Outside or not that long ago? No, this, yeah, this picture could have been taken today. We've got the snow outside here in snowy Colorado. And I'm even sitting in the zap room because this happens to be a computer with a camera. <laughs> so uh, broadcasting live from the zap room. <laughs> so let's see. There we go. Uh, just the disclosure, uh, ZAP is providing an honorarium. I uh, made up some disclaimers to, uh, <laughs> I guess, protect myself from anything I say on accident. Uh, our objectives are to sort of describe our, uh, how we brought our experience from SRS um, on C-ARM Linux, like the Tribune, to this new gyroscopic platform, and uh, some physics solutions to the challenges that are sort of unique to uh, the system. So you uh, just saw these slides. There are the, the two axes um, of the gantries, right? So the system has the axial axis uh, and then the uh, 45 degree offset oblique axis. Uh, you saw this, I'll skip ahead and ouch. And so this is sort of the delivery path that uh, can be generated using those two axes. So uh, this would be a, a full rotation around the axial axis, and then these are different oblique axes. And then there's sort of an exclusion area up here, similar to like the gamma knife helmet, where you wouldn't have a true vertex beam. Uh, and that actually would in theory reduce whole body patient dose during delivery as well. Uh, some more images of, of the call meter itself. Uh, so it, it's uh, a wheel design so it rotates and you can uh, quickly select a different uh, circular aperture. I'll talk about that more. And then the other component that's sort of uh, unique to this system is it has a scintillation uh, detector opposite the MV beam that measures exit transit uh, dose or exit dosimetry. It generates an image sort of like this, it's a TIFF image, and it uh, will analyze that in, in real time during delivery to compare to the expected dose uh, just from the, you know, the total path link through that, that beam uh, to the patient's head. And it'll it'll provide a graph somewhat like this during delivery and it can even interlock the beam if it detects an issue. Uh, I've actually generated this sort of retrospectively from log files just to sort of show the conceptual uh, nature of the, the exit dose. So these are, are beams that are flagged by the system that are exiting basically through the bottom of the CT data set. 
which means patient shoulders. So those are excluded from the analysis. Uh, that's certainly an interesting aspect of the system. Uh, sort of a side-by-side -side comparison. So, so the, down the hall from, from us here is a shrieking that we've had. So uh, now we have sort of both systems to, to compare side-by-side. -side. Uh, they're both frameless, isocentric. The ZAP uh, uses a 3MV beam. Its dose rate is nominally 1,500 mu per minute. Your call meter sizes are 4, 5, 7 and a half, 10, 12 and a half, 15, 20, and 25 millimeters. So that's your maximum field size. So that's the one you have to calibrate with uh, TG51. The call meter selection is, is, is done automate, automatically with that wheel. <laughs> Patient alignment of basically pretreatment uses three KV images sort of spaced out around the patient to provide good geometry to solve that problem. And uh, then the couch is three degrees of freedom. So uh, if you can wrap your head around this, it does pitch, yaw, and long. So a super amp shift is easy, that's longitudinal. Uh, an ant post shift would be pitch plus long, and a left right shift would be yaw plus long. Uh, so at the end of the day, you're not gonna have uh, I guess the perfect alignment, you'll have sort of residual rotational deviations that it, the system determines. Uh, during the alignment, it generates jillions DRRs in the background to figure out uh, the alignment, and it will report to you sort of what your residual rotational deviation is for the trim delivery, and uh, we'll, we'll generally keep those numbers quite small uh, just to make sure that we're not deviating from the planned delivery. So our tolerance would be about one and a half degrees for that. During delivery, uh, it takes KV images at whatever time frequency you want, fall to 45 seconds, and it'll do tracking, or it's automatically moving the couch, just uh, fixing whatever it sees. And if it ha has a larger deviation, it'll, it'll stop that and go and take additional images to, to make sure that, that the alignment is still correct. Uh, beam delivery is at static beam nodes, so it's not doing, doing arcs or anything like that, uh, but the number of nodes is, is quite large. Uh, um, and then the planning process is actually um, going to determine which nodes are kept and, and optimized on. It'll optimize beam weights and normalize the plan. And that's what our fan was talking about, how you can sort of tune the optimizer to give you uh, fast delivery that uses, you know, just fewer beams that are kind of weighted with you know, a larger range of monitor units, or you can sort of force it to keep more beams spread it out better it kind of reduces dose fingers um, and that's sort of the way we're preferring to use it uh, compare that to the true beam that people are probably more familiar with and i'm specifically comparing to just cone planning on the true beam uh, <clears throat> you have the cone diameters you're probably familiar with for every single um, change in size you have to go into the room and you know take the cone in put a new one um, in uh, it does interlock the sizes, of course. Um, alignment on the true beam is cone beam. We have the six degree couch. Align RT is used for the, the monitoring um, instead of like KV imaging. Delivery is done with, with arcs. And between each, uh, I guess, couch angle, the therapist must go into the room to rotate that couch um, because the true beam sees the cone uh, mounted in the system and it, it forces you to do um, those motions uh, from the hand pended. And planning, I mean, cone planning is sort of a manual process of selecting arcs and weights. Here's the, the floor plan for our ZAP system. Uh, notice there's an equipment room kind of in the back that supports the system. I'm sitting right here. These are all glass windows. The operator console is right here adjacent to the system. And, uh, something to sort of highlight is this, this is a, a one meter safety perimeter around the system. It's actually monitored by a laser scanning system. If you, you enter that system during delivery, it'll stop the beam, stop all motions. Uh, you can kind of think of it as like a door in your lock on a traditional vault. So the installation itself was, was a lot of fun to watch. Uh, the system comes in sort of three major pieces for the sphere, and plus the couch is like a fourth piece, so it shows up on semi trucks. They had to crane it from the helipad up over the trees down onto our patio <laughs> and uh, then slide it into place and they did that for each of the components kind of piece them together and that's kind of all of them in the room 
entire system is about 60,000 pounds, and that's because of the self-shielding. It's a lot of steel. And here's the final product. It's, it's beautiful. It attracts a lot of attention, as you can see here. And uh, we started using it, I guess, last summer, summer fall. The, the true beam uh, has been here since 2015. And this is our true beam just uh, down the hall. Uh, as far as the self shielding, uh, Zap has you sort of check, just, you know, spot check around the system as part of the acceptance uh, using, you know, small sampling of beam delivery angles. The survey was, you know, nothing surprising there. Uh, everything is shielded so that outside of that one meter perimeter is, is safe for members of the public. Sort of my interest is in just ongoing environmental monitoring. I have little land hour kind of plastered all over here. And so far, all of our reports have been less than one millimeter per quarter. Uh, if you're more interested in more thorough shielding analysis, these guys did a fantastic job, and I would direct you to their publication. Now, we also looked at uh, leakage dose to the patient uh, during treatment, and uh, it's coming out, I would say, about a factor of 10 lower than uh, similar measurements that I took on our true beam. So that is. Uh, benefit of that lower energy and that geometry. Commissioning the system uh, looks sort of like this. You have to remove part of the end of the couch, put on this, this frame to hold your water tank. It's a PTW MP3 XS. Uh, you utilize the, the software to, to center the detector and the beam um, profiles. So this is the collimator wheel. You measure parallel to the wheel plane and orthogonal so it's wheel plane and ortho plane. So your, your profiles. Um, we evaluated output factors using a, a number of detectors, unshielded diode, the edge. Microsilicon is sort of uh, Zap's preferred detector. We also use the W2 and I have sort of uh, micro diamond and then repeat micro diamond measurements. Uh, they sort of follow the trend you'd expect. Diodes up here, that's the microsilicon. Micro diamond and W2 are right on top of each other here for that four millimeter collimator. You can see how they uh, sort of align. Uh, this is probably my reproducibility on that four millimeter collimator. These were taken, you know, nine months apart. So some challenges to that measurement, but I think 2% on a four millimeter cone is what probably most of you about to see. Anticipating your next question about TRS-483 correction factors. This is for six triple F on a Linac. Six triple F on a CyberKnife. I hesitate to just go applying factors developed from Monte Carlo from different machines to, to this system. But you know, of course, the simulation detector. Uh, if you uh, subscribe to this, doesn't need correction factors. So I think we're doing pretty well with uh, our measurements here. Uh, we also checked our output calibration uh, of TLD. <clears throat> Did pretty well with that. Most interesting profiles and PDDs are going to be the four millimeter. So I'm actually showing three measurements here. The W2 and micro diamond are right on top of each other. Microsilicon is very close, but it's a little bit shallower. Here's a set of profile measurements. Now I'm comparing microsilicon to edge to W2. And these are in plane, I guess wheel plane and cross and ortho plane. These all align very, very well for that four millimeter collimator. So I take your pick detector for those. Oh, so the planning system requires TMRs, but we're measuring PDDs. So you can get down in the weeds very quickly. Uh, we're going to interpolate BJR25 for small field sizes. How do you go about doing that? They give you some guidance there. So I played this game. And started looking a little closer at it, and Todd uh, here, his, his book describes how, you know, those scatter factors are not uh, a big contributor to that conversion. It's mostly the inverse square, so maybe just ignore them, especially for a small field, short SSDs, which is what we have right here. So that means you can just not use them and generate TMR table and I so I did it both ways and compared the results and it winds up being you know tenths of a percent differences. So we went that route where we just decided not to apply uh, the scatter factors. Uh, 
I'm happy to talk more about that. This is what uh, beam data entry in the system looks like. It does use symmetrized profiles. Here's uh, the TMRs, alpha factors. To give you this workspace in that beam data entry where you have to compute a beam, but frankly, this isn't a very useful workspace. You can't compute, you know, export any of this for comparison. So I took my own virtual Bantam and put it into the client system to do that. Uh, there are tools to extract like a dose profile. You can pretty much just keep those from your crosshairs. It's that sort of lacking in the current version of the software. But you can export the DICOM dose. So I did that and pulled out uh, profiles for you know single beam. And so now I'm comparing a PDD from the planning system. So it's a SSD setup to the PDDs that we measured. So sort of coming full circle from um, the TMRs in between. And it actually does quite well uh, for all of those field sizes. So uh, Current version uh, is GP1007. Uh, talked a little bit about the alignment and tracking. Uh, so you, you will treat a plan using multiple ISIS centers. You know, equivalent, I suppose, to taking you know, shots with the gamma knife. In between ISIS centers, it does this, like a two image transitional alignment. Uh, so you can sort of force it to do with the full three image alignment if you want to. The uh, system has a pretty interesting uh, proximity detector on the collimator head, like on the gantry, uh, that will detect a, a collision and prevent collisions. And they also allow the gantry to detour around a collision if, if there is one. It provides for handling of partial treatment delivery, gives you a treatment delivery report. There's also some automation capability uh, that I've been playing with a little bit. Some questions that I get asked about the system. No, it doesn't do cone beam, it doesn't do arcs. Uh, the KV images and DRRs aren't really given back to the user afterwards, uh, but you can, of course, capture screenshots and that sort of thing. It's not a full EMR, like you can't schedule on a calendar, it doesn't handle documents or notes or anything like that. And there, there are not currently interfaces to say Epic or what this risk one is. Uh, treatment planning system does things you'd expect, it contours, there's an auto ISO placement algorithm where it'll sort of load ISO centers and, and beam sizes, I guess kilometer sizes into a target. Uh, had mixed results with that. It will automatically sort of eliminate beams that would be in collision zones. So uh, the true beam has collision issues with cones and, and this uh, zap has some of that too. A lot of that is just related to the current couch design and they have a new design that They've sort of shown me prototypes of and we're anxiously awaiting the release of that we think will, will uh, give us a lot more sort of real estate for beams. But for now, uh, working on that, uh, of course, you can optimize your plan. It'll sum like multiple Zapex plans. So if you have two targets and you want to do a plan sum, uh, you can create that. You can DICOM import CT, MR, structure set, registration objects, DICOM export, CT, structure set, dose object. Uh, it does heterogeneity corrections, just effective path length. You can use a custom CT density table, and you can override a structure density to water, but unfortunately not anything else. It reports some plan quality metrics, and we'll even give you a treatment delivery time estimate. Some of the contouring tools are, are not, not fully developed. Uh, you can't do side-by-side -side comparisons. So if you have one plan and you change something and you want to see what effect that had, you kind of left closing and opening plans. Uh, you also can't have multiple patients open simultaneously. So the planning system is sort of like a single seat, like you have one planner working on one plan at one time. Uh, some of those dose analysis tools I talked about are, are, are lacking. You can't import DICOM dose from like another system. Uh, DRRs aren't really shown to you. If you like really don't like a single beam, you can't really do a whole lot through you know, software to you know, tell it to change the weight of that or remove it or something. Uh, optimization is actually to the surface structures. Uh, so you're not really doing volume based optimization. Uh, it's sort of a, I think a speed um, choice that they made. It doesn't have a tool to do like full, like, you know, dose constraint analysis, like, you know, TG 101 kind of stuff. Uh, doesn't 
integrate with Active Directory. There's no API, no, no biggies, just, just things to be aware of. We created the, uh, the Anderson head, kind of just did a simple plan on it. Uh, looked like this. Uh, came out with 60 beams, goes to the TLDs, it's pretty uniform. Uh, this is what the treatment plan report sort of looks like, uh, just gives you some metrics like this, it tells you number of beams, smart units, uh, MU per, per node, so per gantry angle. Uh, the alignment is like this, and this alignment is in the, the post treatment report as well. So you just do KB alignment. There's uh, three images, but you only really look at two at a time. So the third one is just down here, you jump back and forth between them. Post treatment delivery report this 60 beams took 11 minutes to deliver. Uh, plan versus delivered and use sort of just what you'd expect. And sort of gives you a breakdown of where the system spent time during the delivery. So we passed their 5% three millimeter criteria, uh, those profiles, analysis, we did well on that too much. So we have you know, the true beam and we have the Arius Eclipse Citrix environment. And so we are still using that kind of the EMR functionality. That's where our orders and documents, appointment scheduling is done. The prescription is, is in there. Uh, you use the care paths and clips in their ARIA. And uh, CT simulation is done on the uh, couch overlay that's, that matches what the treatment couch looks like using forfeit mask with a Sibco Acuform head cushion. I'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, because it's just convenient to us, we go ahead and do our contouring and MR registration in Eclipse, and then we'll export all that to the planning, the ZAP planning system to do our plan there, and then we'll review that plan. Then sort of just because I can, and then export that dose back to Eclipse just to, to keep it all in one system. And uh, then I can also use ClearCheck uh, to run a dose constraint analysis right there. You bring PDFs back into ARIA for documentation purposes. Excel is used for backup calc. Uh, I do ISO QA, patient specific QA, treatment delivery, yada yada, charge capture in ARIA. Credit right the true beam. Uh, probably people are familiar with that workflow. This is what that CT sim overlay looks like. So then we build the mobilization. This is a little uh, device to just index the Acuform cushion. Here's the mask we use. Uh, so, so the current version of the couch uh, does limit some of the beam angles. And so until they give us a new version, we're just wanna, sort of learning our way through that. So I figured out a way to sort of pre-plan on just an MR only just to see what sort of beams we would have just before we get too far into the process of simming a patient, we can decide that, you know, maybe that lesion is too anterior, right? So the more anterior you go, the more the couch has to pitch down and that eliminates essentially posterior beams. So, so just sort of doing this to, to learn the system, I can fuse the MR to a scan of just the couch, place it where I expect we'll have the patient actually on the couch, just based on sort of experience, drop some ISO centers on it, and then see what sort of beams that we think we'll have available for planning. And you can optimize on that, just play around with that. And decide that, yeah, this 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 will work before we go all the way down the road of having the patient CT. Uh, Clips cone planning, sort of some things to draw attention to. It treats everything in that body contour as water, doesn't account for support structures, Good luck using the stereo fan on it because you can't set that density to PMMA. Air sinuses treated as water, it's a pencil beam. It does have some planned you know, templates and, and reporting of clinical goals and that sort of thing. And there are issues with clearance, right, on, on the cones here. So both systems are, are not, uh, I guess, free from that. So, so we, and the Eclipse cone plane does not have any way to check clearance, unlike the ZAP system. So we use the RAD. Uh, Clear check um, product to look at all these arc angles. And I also have a SAPI script that I developed, which just sort of looks at the collision space. So anything inside of a sphere with the radius of the distance from ISO to the bottom of the cone would be flagged as soon as they collide. And then these are where the gantry angles would be. So we are, and then I actually also check every single cone plan on the tree with 
just the mass and the predicted house conditions to make sure we won't have clearance issues. Uh, Tubing QA, isocal verification, uh, Vision RT uh, verification on their, uh, their cube phantom uh, after a cone beam alignment of that one of the targets in there. So we check that pre-treatment and I'll do Winston Lutz on that center target. Use rad machine analysis of Winston Lutz of that. And then because I worry about it, I worry about the cone alignment and that cone mount. So I'll take images using the actual cone, so like a four millimeter cone, every 30 degrees of collimator rotation, and look at the walk out of that cone. I'm just analyzing this with some Python code in that center of the forward half max. And our cone walkout on, on the tubing is very, very good and has been good for years. You could be asking, why don't I use NPC? Well, this is a licensed feature from Varian. I don't have that license, but our site is saying it does. So, so that's another option to look at that cone central representation. So I'm bringing that experience to this app. Uh, what sort of checks are we going to do? It has its own self-check that it does, where it checks a few things. It has a steel ball routine, as he does once and less. I'm going to check outputs and uh, look at profiles, do a constant check to the Octavius. And then we're using the SRS map check for stereo fan for locations to the QA. I like the, the Max EA Phantom for doing steel ball tests. It uh, lines. Uh, it's a pseudo anthropomorphic, so the system uh, can handle that with KV imaging and alignment, uh, multiple targets. So this is sort of what that alignment process looks like. You can compare DRR to KV image, gives you a difference image. This is the steel ball workflow where it'll analyze uh, targeting for you and OS and let's results for it are comparable, if not better than the true beam, sort of less than half a millimeter on, on any particular projection. Uh, output I'm doing with the SDBP Phantom from Sand Imaging. So one of the challenges of the system is that uh, it's hard to have an on FOSS beam if you just you're used to a CRM Linux, you just shoot the beam down on your Phantom. Well, here in order to put ice, uh, the chamber at ISIS Center, the couch is going to pitch up, and, and now the surface of your Phantom is not level anymore. So so the solution to that is actually to center it on the couch and then shoot a, a lateral. So that's how we're handling that. And, and then it actually is, is even messier than that. So the CT simulation has, has that overlay uh, that's more or less level. And the delivery system, whenever it drives the couch into its, its sort of nominal position, it, it actually has a 2.6 degree pitch. And all of that is actually handled in the planning system. So on your CT scan, when you put a beam straight down on something, it actually it, it comes off. 2.6 degrees. Um, so you almost have to sort of trick the planning system <laughs> to pitch the couch down to then make that beam come down and be um, incident normal to uh, your wind detector array. So I'm just doing constancy with this. ISO is not on the um, chambers, but but it lets me you know, just look at constancy and profiles and I'm getting great results with that. I can also do a TMR check with it. Uh, backup calc, I, I'm using Excel. I mean, the planning system is pretty much a lookup table, so I basically get the exact same answers. Uh, one of the system outputs is a CSV file that has basically just beam parameters and effective depths for every single beam. So I can kind of drop that in, compare it, uh, just drag it into a spreadsheet and look at my own cone factors and GMRs, and, and I can check the max point dose as well. And then um, sort of more interesting is patients of the QA with the SRS map check. Here um, is how you align it for dose comparison. Because you can't override to anything other than water, uh, I actually made a pseudo CT data set where I overwrote the Hounsfield units of the Phantom cell to acrylic for dose calculation for, for comparison. Then. And um, getting great results with that. This is 2% one millimeter, uh, just a test plan, 98% uh, passing. Not applying any shifts or rotations to this analysis, though so you can in, um, in that software. Ongoing QA um, outputs have been rock stable on this machine and very impressive. Uh, I am interested in, in beam profiles. Uh, so the stereo checker is, is a fantastic uh, tool. It's a portable EPID, so you get really high resolution. This is a four millimeter cone. Uh, in plane, cross plane, 
25 millimeter cone playing cross plane. And, and the stereo checker also allows you to kind of play with things. You can DICOM export the images and then do whatever you want with them. So during acceptance, we were testing the couch and, and because it's doing a yaw plus a long, I wanted to make sure that it was doing accurate motions and as well as the magnitude and linearity. So I just took a bunch of images doing shifts and then played with them in MATLAB and just uh, was able to verify couch or shifts um, some math device, which is a lot easier than you know a laser on graph paper. Um, Justin, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, do you, do you want to wrap it and then I can make sure that they have uh, time to ask questions? Yeah, um, should I? I can stop here, but yeah, we uh, just move on to questions. Then I know I was kind of going long. I, just, I have a couple of quick questions. I know we're getting toward the end here. We started a few minutes late, so I'm going to give us bonus time here. Okay. Um, yeah. Several of them, it looks like you actually were able to answer. They had a question, and maybe you mentioned this uh, about um, planning. Is it inverse or forward planning? Uh, the optimizer is a, you could call it an inverse planner, I suppose. You, you give it some objectives, and it as a, a linear multivariate solver that it'll go through and, and choose which beams to keep and what to weight them as. And then it'll um, come up with a plan organization. It sort of defaults to always doing 99.5% coverage of what you felt the target is with your description dose. Um, okay, so great. Yep. You can iteratively play with that. Then you can go and move isocenters and then sort of come back and, and see how that affects your coverage. Okay, and I'm going to ask one more. There's several very good questions. I actually think that you and Dr. Van Sickle got through a lot of these. Um, the uh, cost, I was going to ask Dr. Van Sickle, I think he had to drop off. The, the cost, the total cost for the machine plus installation at your site, can, can you do, can you estimate that? Do you know how much that was? Um, I, well, Dr. Van Sickle's not on. I would be making up numbers. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I understand. I I wasn't part of any of those agreements, but I, I hope that yeah, it's all park. It's okay. The base yeah. system cost is around two million dollars, is what I believe. Okay. Okay. Good. And and again, I think the point was made that that's significantly less than than for you know many other technologies, and certainly the footprint and the shielding issues are, are managed in a really creative way. Um, well, it's 104. I know people have taken their time to uh, to be at the seminar, and I think it's really been a, a great time. Thank you so much. I'll uh, email Dr. Van Sickle to let him know how much we enjoyed his talk, and uh, Justin, your talk was really uh, very interesting and detailed. Thank you so much. I'd also like to uh, thank the attendees, and uh, really enjoyed meeting you guys and hearing about this amazing technology. So thank you all. All right, we want to thank everyone for um, joining us today. It was a wonderful webinar. We covered a lot of information. We did have a lot of questions come in and we will address those um, if we can uh, at a later date. Um, we do want to um, remind folks that they can get their CME certificate and RSS membership within 48 hours. Eligible attendees will receive an email with instructions on how to claim a CME. Someone asked about that in the question section, so that is that. Um, our next webinar will be on April 27th, tentatively scheduled. Uh, it'll be uh, surface scattered radiation therapy for SRS, so keep a lookout for that. We will have some updates on that shortly. Uh, we have a 2023 RSS scientific meeting on March 23rd and 25th in Universal Orlando, Florida. Orlando, Florida. So check out rssevents.org. Yes, yes. Um, also, you can showcase your practice expertise in stereotactic radiotherapy and radiosurgery. Please contact us um, on the rss.org for that as well. So once again, we want to thank um, all the, both doctors and uh, Justin for joining us today. We appreciate your time. Any last final notes from our speakers? Feel free to reach out if you have any questions that I wasn't able to get to. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I lost my connection there for a little bit, so I missed the end there, Justin. Sorry, but um, be happy to answer anybody's questions if they send them my way. That's great. There were several. That would be wonderful. All right, thank you, everybody. This was a really nice time, and, and uh, thanks for hanging out.
Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.